economic commissions and the people's congress and the mayors. Uh, okay. China has witnessed few major changes in environment policies over the past 30 years. Here I sum up the three, the, the five points. The first one is the states of environment protection in China. It changed from the essential national strategy to sustain, sustainable development strategy. The focus it changed from on pollution control to the combination of the pollution control and ecological protection. And the method changed from end control to source control. The fourth is the scope, changing from the pollution point control to watershed and the territory control. The fifth is the management style, changing from use executive power to use legal and economic measures. Here I like to introduce a little more about the focus changes. In the early 1970s, China's environmental protection started from the treat of the industrial wastes. But during 1980s and the early 1990s, the focus of environmental protection was still around the pollution control. Since in 1998, Severe flood occurred in Yangtze River Basin. It brought the country to realize the urgency of the protecting natural environment and implement a series of the measures. For example, for stopping deforestation of the natural forest in up and the middle stream of Yangtze River and the Yellow River, making ecological recovery and the construction as the top priority in developing far west and uh, formulate a, a lot of uh, policy corresponding to this kind of situation. So all the, all the measures signal the turning point of the Chinese environmental policy. And by the end of the 2005, there are 2,000 2,349 natural protection zones in China. It has a different types and different levels. And uh, there are 528 ecological pyre religions in the unit. Also, in, when we talk about or think about the, the context of uh, China's uh, environmental policy, we will say in the 1970, China has entered the period of a reform and open door policy. This reform in economic level represents China's change from the socialist planning economic to the socialist market economy. So the reform period has been a time of the vast systemic change affect both the structure and the norms of China. And, and this kind of uh, reform, market institution and emphasis on the private produce, it has increased. Most strikingly, almost everyone has been encouraged to produce for prof profit, so as to speed China's uh, economic development and the emergence of the commercial society. So the, Sarah, the credo of the reform is best captured by the famous slogan such as the, to get rich is glorious and development is the overriding importance. During the period of China's reform and open up environment, open up policy, the environmental protection movement in the world has been rising. So this external background is full of both challenges and opportunities for China. Furthermore, the world market which connects China and the overseas has been merged into one after China's joined the WTO. 
So based on above the contents, which is a blend of old and new, plan and market, and internal and external, the impact of reform time on China's protection, environmental protection is quite complicated. On the one hand, the first decades of reform ushered in a vast expansion of the environment protection institutions, laws, and the policies. But on the other hand, the reform also welcomed the rapid growth, economic growth, which is responsible for the dramatic erosion of the quality of China's environment over the past thir three decades. And both because of the continual ability to show up the environment to, to environment protection in the countryside and because of a notable deterior, deteriorating quality of the China's urban environment and the rapid economic growth. So the 1998 National People's Congress dedicated to form increase the authority of the National Environmental Protection Agency. To this end, several changes was made. First, NEPA was promoted to the national status, to the administrative status and the official renamed the State Environmental Protection Administration. This represents the central government pay more attention to environmental protection. Second one, SEPA's function domain was notably enlarged. It took off a lot of uh, responsibility from other administration. So th these changes have allowed for an uh, increased level of functional invest integration and a comprehensive essence to the environmental protection work. The legislative and the regulatory process in the National People's Congress and the SEPA has also become relative open to the international influence with many policies such as uh, environment impact assessment, discharge and the emission per permissions modeled on practice in the United States and other advanced industrial countries like Britain, like Germany. And also, China has signed a lot of the bilateral agreement on environment problem with the United States, Great Britain, and Germany. And in addition to this, regional environment cooperation was improved okay, improve with neighbors. China's uh, increased the involvement in international environment cooperation and the conference. As the, in the global, com, in the global comms, China's particular attention has been paid attention to the protection of the biological diversity. As early as the 1980s, the International Union for Conservation of Nature started to be actively involved in a range of the conservation work in China, including species assessment, protected area management, and world heritage, environmental law, and environmental economics. IUCN has been worked in China as a platform between government, civil society, and the business sectors. So up to now, uh, for contemporary China, where we uh, carry out the environmental pol protect protection policy three decades. But this kind of policy uh, often be, has been called the government mobilized one with the characteristics of the government direct control and the crisis response. Because China's environmental policy was formulated and implemented from top to the bottom, the grassroots 
were scarcely allowed to participate in this formulation. This was also a result of China's centralized political system. As to the role of the Chinese states in environmental issues, it might be concluded as four aspects. First one is the leading with the establishment of the environment protection legislation. The second one is the coordination with the establishment of an environment management system. The third one is the supporting through finance and scientific research. The first one is promoting such as clean production, uh, developing and uh, cyclical ecology with adjusting the industrial structure. Then we're still wondering that, that how about the effect of the China's implementing the environment policy? It seems to me China's grow, there are two points, I, I want to emphasize two points. China's grew rule of law and public environmental awareness and action capability show most promising sign of the success in environmental protection. Recent years, as environmental disputes are on the rise and environmental cons consciousness increased, Chinese people are beginning to tend to the courts and the law to advocate the rights. The Chinese government has, has also recognized the value of the environmental litigation and the sectors of the environment of government. I explore the possibility of establishing a more a some form of the public interest litigation. As to the action capabilities of a citizen, both individual and the local community. There are a lot of this kind of a case across China. Here, I, I want to give one example because it's uh, from my hometown, Anhui province. There is a quite famous the, uh, documentary film. It's uh, called uh, The Warrior of the Chugang a short documentary film on the struggle of the local people, the village people, to save the China village near the Huai River. Actually, there are some key challenges which China are facing now in the area of the environment protection. Since China's environment problems are moving very fast and a quite large scale than anything in the world has ever been seen. There are many important in the structure flaw of structure flaw of the China's economic development and the political system. Here I will emphasize several points. The first one is the, conf the conflict of environment protection with economic growth. Actually, until now, our government and the, and the common people always emphasize the, the speed of the economic growth or the economic development. So a lot of the environmental policy didn't carry out in, from all of the levels, from central government to the local. So that's the very big problem. The second one is the bureaucratic fragmentation and the jurisdictional device. The third one is the limit, the limit of the effort to develop the independent source of the funding. So a lot of the environmental protection units rely on the discharge, we on the collection the, the discharge fee on the factory. So they have no independent rule to carry out the environment policies. The first one is the limit of the public participation in environment decision making. I think this is a very, very uh, big problem in China. Since in the coming 
because in that issues, they will play an increased role in China's economic development. And we need to emphasize, we need to push our government to uh, remedy our environmental problem. The solution, it seems to be, the solution might be a bottom-up political and economic reform. That is far more difficult than certain targets and, sp and spending money on turning the environment situation in China. Looking from this perspective, I think China's leadership need to make it easy for local officials and factory owners to do the right things when they come to the environment by give them the right incentive. At the same time, our government must loosen the restrictions they have placed on the courts, NGOs, and the media in order to enable this kind of groups to become more powerful inform informant of the environmental protection. In addition, I think the international community for the first pass must focus must focus more on assisting China's further reform than on transfer, transfer the cutting edge technologies and the developing demonstrated project. Without a, such a clear IS understanding, not only of what China wants, but also of China needs, the Chinese people and the rest of the world will pay the price. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, my name is Charles Gomez. I'm researcher in this institution at Casa Rui Barbosa and also director of the Center of uh, Law and Politics of Immigration. And of course, I work on environmental refugees. And what I, I would like to ask and also to say that it's, you know, environmental policies and law, although it's not very clear in all the treaties, is also about people and not only environmental, right? So people that are displaced because of environmental uh, change. So I, w I, was, I was listening to you, and there is all this agency, all the levels, national to municipal levels, mm -hmm. and uh, how responsible they are for the displacement of people, mainly in China, because we know that China, you know, there is a huge amount of displacement of people, mainly also in the city, and I consider environmental also in a broad sense, because also because of economic development, the construction of roads, all sort of economic developments that displace a lot of people in China. And also that I have a lack that I've been searching is also the, on, on, the, on the data. How many people are displaced because of this environmental, considering all sort of environmental provoked by the state and also because of pollution, deforestation, and if you can give us data about the numbers of these people also. Thank you. <laughs> so, at first, I said um, my presentation and the paper a little, a little bit similar to the, to the government that gathers uh, speech. There are a lot of the big talk and the empty talk. So, the, that base is a very weak in my paper. And, uh, but in my paper, that, that I have some that base. But in my presentation, I have no that kind of the database. Okay. But, but right now, I cannot tell you the detailed number. Very, very sorry. Maybe we can communicate yeah. after the conference. Yeah.
Welcome in Portuguese. Oh, bem-vindo, ni hao, drastuci, whatever. All right. Welcome to the afternoon, uh, the last session. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I decided uh, that given that I've been chasing each of you individually and haranguing you about how you might want to modify papers, etc., for the book, I had a moment of crisis yesterday afternoon when I looked at my paper and I said, just doesn't work. Just doesn't work. So I sat up and redid it. And what I'm presenting today incorporates some of the material in the actual paper, but the framework is very different. And what I've decided to do is that I break up different periods in the history of the state and the environment. Now, I have to begin by saying that I specifically talk about India, not South Asia. Uh, I personally do not accept the term South Asia, largely because... Uh, I think it's a it's an extraordinarily uh, it's not 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 just as a is it a piece of fiction which my colleagues in India like to perpetrate largely for politically correct reasons, but also because it doesn't serve us very well. I mean, for example, as a South Indian, um, my histories, as I pointed out earlier on, have a lot more to do with Southeast Asia and China um, as much as it is with say North India. Um, so, to that extent, for me to talk about South Asia doesn't make any sense to me in terms of either history or in terms of my own cultural identity. And different parts of this large subcontinental landmass probably has similar kinds of experiences. So I'm going to talk about India, and I'm going to largely, uh, with the exception of the very first slide on the colonial context, really largely talk about post-colonial India. This is a very deliberate move because most of the historiography on India has focused on colonialism. Now the problem is we've been 60, 70, 70 years beyond the empire uh, and as I said yesterday we are imperial agents in our own rights when it comes to our own indigenous peoples and other, other peoples around the world. So it's important to really start taking responsibility and analyzing and being self-critical if you will of our own performance during the last 60 odd years of being a free independent country. So this is an environmental history of the state in India. Now very briefly um, what about the empire? The, uh, begin with the age of empire. What happens during colonialism? Well, I think there are these four big developments, if you will. One of them is largely during this period of 1750 to 1850, um, spurred by utilitarian ideologies of uh, using natural resources, uh, basically environmental. The environment was really a set of resources um, for growth of the economy. There's a tremendous amount of speculative work, speculative uh, investments, if you will, in nature. Now, as Richard Tucker has shown brilliantly, uh, where there was opportunity to exploit forests, for example, these opportunities were taken not just by unscrupulous British 
colonial expat entrepreneurs, but also by a lot of Indians who seized upon the opportunities to make a quick, quick buck. So in other words, this business of reckless destruction, Rab Wirtschaft, as I talk about in my quote, Ratzel and others, uh, the economy of plunder, uh, was not just uh, the responsibility of the white plunderer, but equally that of several groups, uh, some of them are directly caste groups, there were others as well, who participated very much in the, in the creation of a plunder economy. Uh, it's a story that's fairly true for Brazil, other parts of the world as well. Now, along with this came a reaction, which Richard Grow was among the first to point out to, and a number of us have followed in his wake, including myself and my book, Modernizing Nature, that's there, which is that the reaction to this kind of speculative, unscrupulous exploitation of nature was the articulation of the consequences of such exploitation, out of which begins among the early modern environmentalist traditions, which, among other things, show the impact of soil erosion, show the impact of deforestation, initially on microclimates, but then post past in the Humboldtian tradition, a much larger articulation of linkages. The second kind of colonial move was the impact of Enlightenment philosophies, particularly that connecting Bildung, self-cultivation, and economic growth. Or in other words, the rise of the individual, of the self-conscious, developed self-consciousness, uh, the cultured human being, would not be possible without economic growth. That kind of idea went along with modernization theory and in what some scholars like Cowan and Shetton talk about intentional development as opposed to imminent development, right? Or in other words, development as a conscious effort on part of the state to develop the economy as a way of freeing people so that they could partake of culture. So this was a second big trend in the colonial period. The third thing, of course, uh, as a combination of the first two trends is the rise of what one might call imperial governance, which is large, big bureaucratic structures like irrigation departments, forest departments, and so on, that were inherited in the post-colonial context as well. Now, uh, this has severe environmental effects. For example, in the case of forestry, it produces monocultures, uh, which eliminates the diversity of forest uh, forest. Uh, trees, for example. Uh, in the case of uh, irrigation, as Rohan pointed out this morning, it results in the transformation of entire ecologies uh, into, uh, into these perpetual production regimes, uh, along with dreams of interlinking rivers and so on and so forth that also begin to start emerging in this period. Severe environmental effects, but also following up on uh, your point just now, a tremendous amount of displacement. So the beginning of evictions of large numbers of people and also the codification and legitimation of the eviction through using of eminent domain law to basically allow the state to take legitimacy over evicting people. This codification began to take place right about the 1870s onwards and began to continually happen in one natural resource sector after another, justified on grounds that the greater good in, in order for the greater good to happen, some people have to lose. And they will benefit later on by being incorporated into the riches, which, of course, whether it happened or not, is a big historical contention. A lot of us, including I, will argue that it didn't happen. The last thing, of course, are the contradictions within the state itself. On the one hand, uh, the colonials themselves, as Elizabeth Whitcomb pointed out brilliantly in a book, Agrarian Conditions in Northern India, a long time ago, even before the field environmental history was coined, uh, in the Indian context, uh, were up and really wondering about the extent of corruption that was there. And this, again, was a collusive corruption. It wasn't just a corruption of the indigenous. It was all forms of corruption in, in, involving white, white sort of controllers of these regimes themselves. Um, there was also a tremendous amount of intergovernmental rivalries, for example, between agriculture and forestry departments and so forth, which have continued to this day. And to a, dis to a considerable extent, um, what uh, reflection of what William Bynot in the South African context talks about as a desegregated state. I mean, in other words, Indian state was by no means in the colonial period, we could call it a monolithic kind of entity. It was a highly internally competing kind of entity. So much for the colonial period. The post-colonial period begins what I call in my, in my article the, ra the age of Faustian development. Now, on page 22 of my article, I kind of describe uh, what, what I mean by Faustian development by citing a, a couple of uh, art, 
books that have been written in this context. But primarily, uh, to summarize it, it's a commitment to big things, big projects, giant projects like dams and so forth, expert systems, and state authority. Large, big command and control systems, um, and, and, and giantism, essentially. The idea is that giant, big things result in greater public good, was the point behind this. Very much an extension of the Enlightenment kind of thinking. It is brought to India particularly by this sort of mishmash of Fabian socialism, Simonianism, etc., that was picked up by many um, stripes of Indian colonials, um, Indian uh, students who studied in Britain and elsewhere in Europe across ideological stripes, across the stripe from the socialist to the, the Hindu nationalist, all of them actually imbibed in similar ideas of nationalist development, which is one of the reasons why this giantism is, will never disappear from the, as a main meme in Indian environmental governance. Even the current regime change hasn't changed that. Now, Nehru, of course, is famous, the first Indian prime minister, was famous for a statement that dams are temples of modern India, which is an example of this statement, this uh, commitment to uh, big, uh, big, uh, big dams. Faustian also because the Faustian compromise brought with it the challenge of what happens when the results of this backfire. Uh, and this is something that Goethe himself struggles with, and it's very much a thing that Nehru struggled with and his daughter, Indira Gandhi, struggled with as well. In a number of the quotes, that are long quotations that I deliberately put in there, for your benefit, they'll be taken out from the main article in order to be edited for space. You could see her grappling with, on the one hand, the need to develop and the impact it has on indigenous people's environment and so on. You could see her really grappling with this, and it's, a, it's not trivially done. It is not an easy problem for the Indian state by any means at all. Um, but what does persist is the idea that you do need to develop. You get the Green Revolution, for example, which was actually a result of a tremendous amount of deliberation by the state and a lot of democratic consultation. The Indian state took it to take the idea of develop a green revolution to 18 different states. There were public hearings. Uh, India is a democratic context, which is one of the most important facets of the Indian state, which is it very often reflects public opinion. It incorporates dissent very, very well. Uh, very often, uh, what was dissent yesterday becomes policy today. It's a very responsive state, partly because, on the one hand, it is... Uh, accountable in an election basis and a five-year election cycle, but also partly because the, India, the Indian leadership right from the early stages recognized that co-opting dissent was a better way of dealing with it than to try to put it down. So this is one of the key features, if you will, of the Indian state amongst uh, the BRICS countries. I think Brazil's the other one that comes very close to us in this regard. Now, the next thing that needs to be mentioned about, the, about Indira Gandhi's face, after all the most dominant phase of post-colonial India, is her encounter with Western environmentalism. And I produced a number of quotes in this, but I'll just kind of read out a couple of sentences here and there to give you flavors of it. For, for example, she begins by saying, we do not want to put the clock back or realign ourselves to a simplistic natural state. Or in other words, development as a state policy is a given. We don't want to go back to nature. Complete rejection of the back back to nature kind of ideology or the idea that pre-colonial contexts were good. She rejects that completely. The second kind of point, the big point that she makes is that um, in the Stockholm speech that you mentioned, uh, in the Stockholm conference, in which she really, in India was a big presence in the Stockholm conference, largely because of this speech. It has to go down as probably one of the most important speeches on the environment uh, given in the 20th century. Articulates much of the position of virtually all the BRICS countries. She says, development is not the cause of most of these problems, but the cure. It's, it's a beginning, uh, the thing. We should move away from the single, that, also reflect a moment. We should move away from a single dimensional model which equates growth of GNP with development. So, it talks about an all-embracing, almost like a Porto Alegro kind of, let's kind of mix up development with social goods kind of argument. Very, very far, you know, far reaching in many respects. And then, she really looks, takes it, takes on the Americans uh, and the Europeans, particularly the Americans. Paul Ehrlich had come to India, met her, and commented, among other things, that what is India? People, 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 people. It's a famous quote. Um, and she doesn't like it at all. And she says, she launches out. She says, on the one hand, the rich look rich, meaning the West, looks askance at our continuing poverty. On the other hand, they warn us against their own methods. 
We do not wish to impoverish the environment any further. And yet we cannot for a moment forget the grim poverty of large numbers of people. Are not poverty and need the greatest polluters? So from here came this idea that poverty is the is the, it is greatest polluter, the key, key sentence of the speech. And then she says, the extreme forms in which questions of population and environmental pollution are posed obscure the total view of political, economic, and social situations. Out of it, she then goes on to launch a enormous critique of Western consumption. She says, it is an oversimplification to blame all of the world's problems in increasing population. Countries with a small fraction of the world population consume the bulk of the world's production of minerals, fossil fuels, and so on. And in fact, because of this attack, Paul Ehrlich modifies his thing and comes up and says, uh, its impact, impact is not just population, but also population times affluence times technology. So allowing for uh, the presence of Western consumption to, to be part of the demographic equation. So what you get with Indira Gandhi really is, on the one hand, a kind of a pre-Bruntland um, take on sustainable development. She never uses the word sustainable development. That's exactly what she says in 1972. And prior to that, in 1967, there is a, spe a speech uh, that I also cite from in which the, the, the key concepts of Brundtland are very clearly identified as part of the Indian uh, state kind of articulations that were there. There's a backstory to how exactly she got there, some wonderful consultations that take place within, between the state and Indian society. And what she presents was really a very much of a deliberative consensus across all much, much of the bodies of the intelligentsia in India. Uh, India also was benefit, benefited a tremendous amount by the fact that at that time, Delhi was fortunate to receive some of the most interesting people as uh, ambassadors. Among other things, Carlos Fuentes was Mexico's ambassador to Delhi, uh, a famous Brazilian. So in other words, a lot of the critical masses of the most interesting world intellectuals were ambassadors in Delhi and virtually served as sounding blocks for the Indian leadership at the time. So the Indian position at Stockholm represented quite a bit of at least a lot of the Latin American opinion that she sought and read and uh, very clearly articulated. Now, what's interesting after that is that... Um, Paradoxically, her son gets tremendously taken in both by Ehrlich, um, who really influences him, and by Hausmann, the, the famous Paris uh, architect who demolishes all the slums and rebuilds modern Paris. And what you therefore get is the imposition of the emergency, which is an attempt at trying to stay in power because a court in, in northern India in Allahabad had pronounced her election as illegal. Uh, and some of the, they wanted to move removed on corruption grounds. And she tried to legitimize her own control on, on grounds that governance was needed and somebody needed to be an authority. It was one of the darkest moments in Indian democracy where she literally declares emergency and assumes power for some, several number of months and runs this country like a dictatorial regime. But in this period, it began this amazing assault on the human rights of poor populations. The state comes in with extraordinary amounts of efficiency, identifies people, and sterilizes them so that they cannot reproduce. This is forcible, forcibly, forcibly done. There's no real uh, scope to uh, have any say. This wasn't, uh, I mean, this is not, not a democratic moment at all. This is also a moment at slum clearance. Uh, huge amounts of slums, urban slums, were just bulldozed and rebuilt. And in one stroke, what they did was they made it impossible subsequently to either talk about population control or indeed uh, new forms of urban imaginaries that could make poverty uh, more inhabitable, or in other words, alternative forms of settlements besides slums, uh, simply because any time you produce dialogues like that in post-colonial, post-emergency post post era, the discourse always slams back to, oh, this is exactly like Indira Gandhi's emergency. So it is one of the worst moments ideologically as well. Yeah, I'm looking. Actually, I'm 15. I've got the clock there. Um, the, the other thing is that uh, Indira Gandhi also laments, and I have a quote on page 30 about this. Uh, she goes to a forestry m meeting of the Indian Association, 100th centenary of the establishment of forestry in India. And the forest minister at the time says, uh, we've been very fortunate to have a prime minister who is such a great advocate for the environment. Uh, and she was, and she really was a major player in the environmental imaginary. And she says, what's the point of calling me an advocate when nothing is being done? 
And there's a moment of, and this is interesting because I've been studying Indira Gandhi now for a while and looking at her archives. Uh, the amount of frustrated letters that she sends out across the board from, to population ministries, to health ministries, to forest ministries, and so on, basically saying, why on earth don't you implement policy? And she, she really, really throws up her hands and says, why does my government not work? And this is one of the interesting conundrums about modern India, which is the failure of uh, the disconnect between great ideas and India, I mean, if you look at the history of ideas in terms of white papers and so on, it's one of the most progressive ideas, none of which really make it onto the ground. And nobody really understands the sociology of the lack of misgovernance. How exactly does this occur? To me, this is one of the most important issues to study, which is one of the reasons why in my own work right now, I'm framing my, work, my own work as governance science. It's sort of is a discipline that I'm trying to promote uh, within both my work in Santa Cruz as well as in Bangalore where I teach as well. Um, how do we understand governance systems? And she throws up her hand, doesn't really understand. One other point is need, needs to be made about Faustian development, which is the existence of a number of dissenters within the, uh, within the state. Um, lots of people within government uh, who produce some of the most interesting critiques within. So, for example, official state colonial forestry gets replaced by a new hybrid called joint forest management, which involves forest management with people, in consultation with people, and using the resources of people and giving back to the people. This idea was largely articulated by government people, including forest departments' own officers. Likewise, in irrigation, some of the in most interesting players advocating alternative hybrid models of participatory irrigation systems were people who came out of the government systems, criticized the government thing, and produced state-sponsored alternatives. So, Again, there's a very interesting, what this shows, of course, is that this isn't, that this, there isn't really a very strong disconnect between the state and civil society in India. It's a continuum. It's just a very, uh, there's a lot of revolving door that goes on, and good ideas make it, um, always plagued by the question of why it doesn't get implemented on a large scale, although in small scales, they're very interesting. Now, to quickly go on, the age of risk. Uh, this is the age which I grew up largely, uh, I was 20 years old, dates me, when Bhopal happened. And I spent three years working on Bhopal and written the most amount of work on the Bhopal gas disaster myself. And subsequently, in fact, I just have a book that's coming out on the 30th anniversary, looking at social theory after Bhopal, not just about the Bhopal accident itself. Bhopal largely gets construed as a big multinational, American multinational corporation that went wrong. To me, that's only the smallest piece of the story. I think Bhopal threw up the question, a big crisis of the lack of expertise, what I call missing expertise. The articles are out there, and I can give you references if you want. They're even in my article here. Um, I talk about the, the missing expertise in terms of dealing with the contingency of an accident. When something novel and big happens, how does the state react? We had no idea how to do it. When something novel happens, so much so that you have no prior experience, how do you then deal with a an evolving problem when several thousands of people, in this case half a million people, have congenital disease. How do you rehabilitate them over a 15-year period of time? Um, the state has no ability to do this. Um, ethnographic expertise. For example, how do you troubleshoot a victim's expression of pain? Um, or in other words, listen empathetically. The state's not capable of listening. Now, these are not uniquely Indian problems. We see the same things resonate, for example, in Hurricane Katrina. We see the same things resonate with Chernobyl, with Valdez. These are all problems that modern states have not been able to solve. And I highlight them um, very extensively in this thing as, a, as an issue that Bhopal began to highlight, not just as an Indian problem, but as a global problem with the governance of risk. It's not just a third world problem. Now, this is no, not a discount political economy. You see the numbers here, here, yourself. Uh, and the quote at the bottom, which is directly from the uh, uh, annual report of the Union Carbide Company, after the resolution, after the uh, Bhopal case was resolved, the company had the, made the largest profits in terms of per share basis uh, in its 70-year-old history after the Bhopal disaster took place. Uh, so this is, in some respects, some of the most cynical uh, kinds of uh, resolution, if you will, in terms of the ability of a big multinational corporation to walk away uh, from anything. Um, and, you know, they're all in my, in my chart. And I, I've got to show you the next one, which is the most chilling of all. I was researching PR companies and, and how public relations emerges as a... As, a, as, a, as an industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, all our names are, in, are, are actually in 
databases. I, I found mine, for example, looking into a big private company. It's a pure accident. They keep records of every major environmental activist, uh, key outspoken academics, etc. They're all sold and traded and so forth. Um, everything we've written is summarized. In my case, articles, key sentences were pulled out. Um, it's fine. Um, but this is the interesting thing from the biggest company. It says, a corporation cannot compensate for its inadequacies with good deeds. Its first responsibility is to manage its own affairs profitably. We should no more expect a corporation to adopt a leadership role in changing the direction of society than we should expect an automobile to fly. The corporation is simply not designed for that role. This is by the CEO of the company that is hired by Union Carbide to manage the Bhopal account. He was also at the company that managed Ceausescu in Romania and a bunch of other dirty regimes around the world. Um, but what's interesting is, in a sense, it captures the meme of this Goldman Sachs consensus, which produces bricks to begin with. And this is one of the big things we all have to uh, talk about. Given the fact that Goldman Sachs has invested in a business school in China, uh, is investing in a business school in Brazil, and is investing in business schools in India now. Or in other words, it's training a bunch of foot soldiers with this ideology which simply says, we're accountable to people who invest in us. And that's what it is. We're not accountable to the people at large. And this is one of the most interesting aspects of BRICS in terms of counterposing the BRICS ideology with some of what we are trying to do in terms of, okay, what does civil society in BRICS do, essentially? Now, this, I'm going to have to be quick because I only have six or seven minutes left, according to my clock. Um, one of the good things about Keynote is that you don't need to be policed. It's policing me. Um, the interesting thing here is that... Uh, We've had a number of issues. Uh, nuclear, I began to work a lot on nuclear uh, as well. Very difficult. But I found that a major breakthrough two years ago in the nuclear thing because they were never talking. And then we got a consultancy, a Terry, with an organization that I work. They asked us to do an analysis for the first time on how publics think about the Atomic Energy Commission. I can't speak much about this because... A lot of the data, I can't talk about the data because it's, it's proprietary. I can't, hand, I can't give it at the moment. Hopefully they'll allow us at some point. But what was interesting to me was the fact that under public pressure, they're willing to actually, they're actually nervous for the first time ever. That's one thing. The other thing, this is a hitherto very closed regime, which is not, not even accountable to the Indian parliament. But the other thing that's been very interesting is that I took a, I wrote an article which they read. Uh, in one of the major national newspapers, in which I said, forget about protesting against the nuclear question. I'm not going to ask the question whether we should have nuclear energy or not. Instead, I'm going to ask the question, under what conditions can we have nuclear con energy? And I talked about the conditions in which we could have it. One of the things they talk about is cultures of safety. Now, this was interesting. This got their thing was they finally found a way in which they could talk to somebody. They said, okay, you're not necessarily protesting. Again. Your starting position is not anti-nuclear energy. Okay, so we can talk. They haven't talked a great deal, but they've talked some. So there's been a kind of a breakthrough moment for me, for us, some of us, me in particular, in that they've given us an open-ended op opening to be able to talk to them. And what I'm hoping is that over the next five to ten years, we'll be able to do the kinds of analysis of safety cultures. You know, so that we can begin to see whether the safety cultures in the Indian system are as bad as they are in, as they were in Chernobyl in Ukraine, or as we found out in Fukushima in Japan, which was diabolical by every stretch of imagination. And I suspect, uh, having interacted with Chinese scholars who seem to be doing exactly what the Indians did previously, which is to black box and say, we're doing the best we can. Oh, and the most, the best brains are being put in, et cetera, et cetera, which black boxes everything we understand about complex systems and so on, which show that it is extremely difficult to actually put in expert systems to manage nuclear power. Um, and the Indians are doing exactly that. The Chinese are obviously doing exactly that right now. But the Indians have finally begun to open up. On the case of GMOs, there was a real public debate. The, the then, chief, the then uh, minister... Uh, went to a number of states and really had a public debate. We've had a moratorium on GMOs for quite a while right now. That's being lifted right now to some extent, but not easily. The courts have gotten involved, and it's going to be fought out very, very much. There were large cases of a pollution leading, among other things, to the mandating of a single fuel, compressed natural gas, to fuel all public systems. There was an attempt at trying to uh, Im implement the Curitiba model in Delhi, which is a tremendous failure. Um, they tried to build bus, a bus lane like in Curitiba, uh, which uh, was a spectacular failure in, in, in Delhi. There's a paper in which I analyze 
that completely. Uh, but an attempt, nevertheless, to learn from another BRICS country in terms of an experience. Even the failure teaches us something about what actually went wrong. Most recently, there's been a National Disaster Management Authority, which, again, uh, is plagued by the fact that it's been constructed almost entirely by engineers and geologists. Uh, for, among other things, the advice on nuclear safety is that they're advising citizens to put wet handkerchiefs over their heads in the event of a nuclear... This is on the website. You can go and read it. Um, or in other words, no attempt to try to inc incorporate any form of what we understand in terms of public understanding of radiation into anything that goes on. This, and it, this goes to hydrology and every other form of disaster management. No social analysis whatsoever. I've got three minutes left, according to this. So, uh, four minutes. The last but one thing is the, uh, is the age of theft. What's that? Uh, but it says, uh, uh, don't, don't interrupt me. I'll take from your time. Uh, <laughs> you're coming after me. Um, the age of theft, which is the last but one. The age of theft, the last one, come go together. We're in the age of theft. We've always been in the age of theft. I mean, Indians have been plagued with stealing from the environment. Uh, this has been the lament from time immemorial. Um, but right now, the landscape of theft involves not just traditional bootleggers, which have always been there, uh, people quickly trying to bake a buck out of any opportunity that's there. But you've got large Indian firms like the Mittals and so on. Mittals are, of course, everywhere. They're trying to pillage everywhere from Brazil to Australia and South Africa. They're everywhere. Arcelor Mittal, it's called right now. Uh, the, there are many other Indian companies in the mining business. We're amongst the biggest private players in mining uh, right now. Uh, and the Indian state kind of looks upon them with a tremendous amount of patronizing affection because they're able to do uh, what the Indian state is not able to do with respect to the Chinese in Africa. Or in other words, what the state couldn't do in terms of grabbing property in Central Asia and Africa, Indian private companies have been able to do. Um, the other thing, without any of the negative reactions, so for example, Chinese in Africa have drawn a lot of negative res response. The Indians have done it in a much more subtle way. It's gone with Bollywood, soft power. Uh, we are loved. Um, the Chinese are hated. So uh, it's sort of very interesting, that particular, even though the impact is the same. We're equally imperial in Africa. Um, the other thing that comes up with the, with the age of theft is the ideology of the free market, um, you know, which of course has come in big time because of the influx of a number of... Uh, Pat Mooney, the wonderful Canadian social thinker, talks about an agree culture, a culture of people trained in the same institutions, Chicago economics and so on, who agree upon certain principles. They're, they're the same, they're all, they're all buddies, uh, just like we are buddies, uh, the guys who run bricks, they all went to the same colleges, and they hang out together, uh, and they speak the same languages in terms of what constitutes growth and so on. So the agree culture produces an ideology of the market uh, which treats environmental issues as completely external, as externalities, and they do believe that they have market solutions for them, which lie in commodifying them. Complete failure, as you know, but this is the official doctrine in India, it's a doctrine in Brazil, etc., etc., China as well. Last but by no means least, the reaction to this, which is rampant Maoism. Uh, there's some statistics, uh, Rohan can correct me, but I think something like in the nature of uh, almost a third of India is virtually ungovernable by the Indian state because it's controlled completely by the Maoists uh, because they don't want the state to get in there and capture their resources. It's one of the biggest internal contradictions, if you will. Last but by no means, response to this. It's called the age of accountability. Along with this age of theft has been a large civic movement which translated into enormous public pressure being adopted to create the passage of, among other things, Right to Information Acts. So the National Right to Information Act mandates the government under punishment of, of, the, of an official. He can be suspended, he or she. Every, every state office has to have on office a Right to Information officer. They have to declare information when it's publicly requested immediately within a stipulated period of time. If they don't do so, they can be sacked. So this has been far-reaching, and it's totally changed the landscape of governance in India. There are websites, there are litigation galore, all kinds of things. And, you know, fundamentally, I'll end with this. There is um, a tremendous amount of representation. This, by the way, is a ballot box. India adopted an electronic ballot system to get rid of ballot stuffing and so on. The entire Indian election is conducted electronically and is not contested, like in America, like in the U.S. Uh, there's been no contest in terms of elections because they're 100% accurate. Electoral boxes go to remote corners of India on elephant backs in some cases and camels and so forth. So old technology is coming along with the new. 
And there's a huge debate about plurality and diversity. This is a big debate. How do we include those who are marginalized, whether they're tribals, whether they're caste groups, and so on? This displacement question is one of the fundamental questions about development. It's not gone away. It's not going to go away. It's always there. I'll leave you with this because I have no time. Uh, but in a sense, it describes the landscape of the contestation against the state. Thank you. I don't do PowerPoint. I'm, I'm, I don't do PowerPoint. But I don't want that showing while I'm talking. How do I turn it off? It's a, no, right here. Okay. I don't know how to. I don't use it. Let's get rid of this image. Thank you. Oh, that would be better. There's a cat, but no, no, but they're seeing the, the stuff in here. No, 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 no. Okay. Can you please uh, take it off? Yeah, why would I want that? <laughs> no, I don't want PowerPoint. Okay. Greetings, colleagues. I'm Paul Josephson. I'm a historian like many of you. I'm from uh, central Maine. Uh, what I've learned today, and I'll give an example and then get into my talk, is that historians ought to be given more authority over decision-making and environmental issues. And uh, uh, the example I'd like to give is that when I first got to Colby, I watched a massive landscaping project as part of the construction of a new building, taking out lawn, rebuilding the lawn, bringing in truckloads of dirt, and then laying, unrolling rolls of grass on top. And the next day it rained, and the area where they'd built this new lawn filled with water. So I wrote a letter to the director of the project and said, I'm not a geologist or a landscape architect, but if I taught as badly as you design projects, I'd be fired. I got a short response, would I like to talk about this, but I did not answer that. Um, so my, my comments about uh, Russia, state power, and the environment are given in that same uh, spirit. I'm interested in the fact that uh, this is a nation that's so rich in resources, uh, for example, with roughly one-fifth of the world's forest. Uh, it's an imperial power, an empire with both internal and external aspirations. And yet we've seen over the last hundred years uh, inefficient, even profligate use of resources, uh, bureaucracies whose plans and approaches are rational on paper only, haphazard, even violent waste disposal, weak and poorly enforced environmental protection laws, and crucially, from the point of view of governance, uh, poorly developed public institutions and civic culture. The absence of public institutions or the weakening of public input meant planners' preferences uh, ha prevailed over a consumer and other choices, that the central value was given to rapid economic growth, uh, and yet at the same time undervaluing resources from economic, political, and cultural points of view. And so the promise that the Soviets would create a society that took care of nature in the way that rapacious capitalism did not uh, of the early 1920s uh, quickly gave away to the Stalinist economy and polity. And I would argue that that economy and polity persisted at least through the Brezhnev years in one form or another. So that while ecologists, biologists, and others understood the complexities of human nature interactions. Planners and policymakers tended to see nature for its bounty 
an obstacle, or even at times as an enemy. And planners embrace central planning mechanisms to ensure meeting targets for production, investment in filters or scrubbers or other technologies to make production safer or more efficient or more environmentally sound were given less attention or often simply not pursued. And as I've heard in two other papers this afternoon, the state adopted large-scale, even gigantic, costly projects from mines and smelters to forestry operations to agriculture known only for significant environmental costs. These included, of course, the gulag uh, prison camp projects to build infrastructure. During the Cold War and after, military concerns prevailed that in reinforced production as the sine qua non of economic and political life. Cold War nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons programs contributed to ongoing environmental degradation. And in fact, to this day, officials continue to undervalue resources or at least see them solely for uh, their quick sale value. They continue to promote profligate development practices, uh, embrace in gigantomania, and see nature as a commodity machine. In agricultural programs, uh, in agriculture, programs have been equally costly from resource, land, and human points of view. At the same time, alternately permitting, subjugating, and co-opting public organizations, the authorities limited the influence of civil society on environmental policies and claimed that only they truly spoke for the worker. The fact that nature belonged to all the people remained a constant for all Soviet leaders, but state ownership, or speaking for the worker, as it uh, as you might call it, meant governance of resources to reinforce state, the state's economic, political, and military power, and it meant inadequate or poorly enforced regulation and at times the discounting of expert input. And finally, let me say by the way of introduction that I evaluate uh, history as we all do on the basis of archival documents and uh, including project plans and reports, speeches, memoirs, newspapers, journals, and the like. And I try to evaluate Soviet achievements and difficulties against the pronouncements that I read and find in the archives about what they intended to achieve and how those pronouncements coincide with a reality. I think that's the fair way to do it. This is what we intend to do. What have you really succeeded in doing? Uh, they claimed to treat nature better than the capitalist could in the name of the worker. Um, I think there's some argument there. Uh, thus, a political culture, uh, uh, economic desiderata, gigantomania, large-scale systems, and the view of nature uh, as something to be consumed have constrained more participatory forms of governing society and uh, nature. For the last 15 years, I've been asking myself whether open forms of governance are more favorable for the environment and the people within it than are more closed systems. Yes. As you know from uh, reading the paper, or as you might imagine if you haven't read the paper, I could now uh, outline how policies and practices changed under the Soviet leaders from Lenin to Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Gorbachev, uh, to the present under uh, President Putin. And that is what I do in the paper. It's fascinating. We don't always do this with uh, other uh, uh, societies, focus so much on the leader's uh, preferences. But given the uh, centrally planned economy and the top-down nature of the political system, one-party system, and the great power of the general secretary, uh, that seems fair, in fact, even uh, obligatory. I think there was promise under Lenin in the 19 uh, early uh, years of Soviet power, although the Bolsheviks came to power facing such uh, tremendous uh, obstacles, war, civil war, famine, epidemics, and so on. But in a series of early proclamations, uh, it seems to me they indicated 
uh, a willingness to entertain uh, the importance of involving the public and experts in evaluating the uh, status of resources and their use for uh, society. Uh, on the other hand, those same great pressures of war and civil war and economic recovery uh, often tilted the balance against uh, nature and civic culture. And yet in the 1920s, we see the flourishing of a large number of different uh, public organizations, uh, forerunners of what we might call um, uh, e NGOs, uh, uh, scientists, uh, societies that uh, they formed just after the revolution, dozens of new scientific research institutes. So there was a tremendous prospect uh, for a give and take between political leaders, uh, the public, uh, experts, and nature itself. Uh, as we know, uh, under uh, Stalin, uh, nature and the state uh, took on a significantly uh, different relationship. Uh, Stalin engaged in a self-proclaimed break, although with Lenin, although he did not say with Lenin, uh, in culture, science, technology, and nature and an entirely transformationist ideology uh, came to play, top-down, bottom-up, involving people and nature. A series of five-year plans was intended through rapid industrialization and collectivization of agriculture to uh, tame nature and bring it to heel and to serve state programs. Uh, those state programs involved reaching and surpassing the West in its production. Uh, these state programs also, of course, uh, contributed to mass migration, urbanization, rural conflict, uh, even mass starvation. Uh, Three million peasants in Ukraine, uh, 1.5 million in uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, but the idea was to transform society from the bottom up, from the top down, including the engineering of nature and uh, an effort uh, that involved beginning to see nature as enemy. Uh, even in literary and other uh, venues, we can see uh, uh, an attitude among many writers who embrace the Stalinist approach of nature as being an obstacle uh, to progress. And yet those nascent groups of scientists and specialists who had formed societies in the 1920s of environmentalists or ecologists or admirers of nature continued to function and as Doug Wiener among others have pointed out uh, was able, were able to uh, create and preserve a number of uh, nature study areas or zapovjednike. Uh, but because of uh, undervaluing of natural resources, the pressure of plan fulfillment, and continued emasculation of civic culture. In fact, the harnessing of workers uh, to the plan, uh, nature was under threat. Uh, in the paper, I also look at the impact of World War II and reconstruction on uh, nature and governance questions. And there was tremendous devastation, as you might imagine, not the least of which were 25 million uh, Soviet citizens uh, who died. But imagine the fires, the explosions, the shells, the haphazard and intentional disposal of chemicals and fuels and ordnance, the blowing up of factories and oil fields, the, the scorched earth policies one way and the other, bombardment from airplanes and tanks that left rubble and craters, chemical weapons to disfoliation, defoliation and toxic pollution, people stripping the countryside of everything that there was, almost 32,000 industrial enterprises destroyed. And yet in the post-war years, rather than celebrate hard-fought victory of the Soviet people over the, uh, uh, the Germans, um, Stalin re-emphasized the same program of industrialization, mega-collectivization, and I ideological uh, repression. Uh, so that once again, the five-year plans of big industry and gigantomania came into play. Uh, the, the high point of Stalinist attitudes towards nature was the Stalinist plan for the transformation of nature adopted in 1948, uh, which was passed unanimously, not surprising, by the Communist Party, 
which called for the uh, building of nature as a machine uh, the, in the European USSR, turning all rivers into systems for transport, hydroelectricity, uh, irrigation, uh, agricultural purposes, and so on. And throughout it all, a continued subjugation, infiltration of any potential civic organizations. The Khrushchev era was an era of uh, great political reform, of thaw and de-Stalinization, an abandonment of socialist realist uh, texts in literature, a rebirth of visions of communist constructivism, of environmental awareness, of uh, informally established groups or circles to supplement those environmental groups that had been founded in the 1920s. And yet, major features of the Stalinist system of economic development persisted, central planning, planners' preferences, and large-scale projects. For example, the Virgin Lands campaign to increase agricultural production, which in three years led to the sowing of 40 million hectares of land, 23% of all sown land in the Soviet Union. Uh, the rise of Central Asian irrigation to promote cotton and fruit culture, uh, Siberian development to establish industry further away from the potential uh, Western Front, and the continued growth of the military, especially nuclear enterprise. All of these things counterbalanced uh, hope for uh, more rational governance of uh, nature and people in nature under Khrushchev. Uh, but I do want to stress the fact that in the post-war years, uh, there was a rise of public concern and interest in environmental issues. Uh, Soviet newspapers began to publish debates over, for example, plans to build paper mills on the shores of Lake Baikal, uh, the largest freshwater lake in the world by total volume with 1,500 endemic species, uh, writers, uh, from Leonid Leonov, who wrote uh, Ruski Les in 1953, 1953, and uh, the rise of village prose, uh, writers like Valentin Rasputin, who uh, criticized the Soviet development model, indicated a new state of affairs uh, between uh, state power and uh, civil society. Although I must uh, point out also that uh, in indigenous people continued to pay the greatest price for of uh, the Soviet system of development in their collectivization of reindeer hunting and herding, fishing, the use of their lands for nuclear testing, and their continued treatment as backward and second-class citizens, which we see in all countries of the world, BRICS and others, for example, in the United States. Um, I'd like to skip over the... Uh, Brezhnev era, except to point out that the Brezhnev government uh, began a concerted effort to pass legislation to protect the environment, to establish nature preserves, to regulate industry and agriculture through laws that limited pollutants and fined lawbreakers. And this was, as we heard earlier today, similar to uh, what occurred in uh, China, uh, with legislation being passed similar to that in the West, and uh, in part because of involvement in UN and other inter United Nations and other international regimes. We also see in the Brezhnev era increasing role of specialists in the policy process. But let's keep in mind that uh, engineers at Colby, uh, no, I'm sorry, I was talking about the Soviet Union, that engineers trained in any cultural milieu will tend uh, to look at the tools of their their trade with the broader visions of society. And in the Soviet Union, this meant that large-scale technological systems were the way to go. And so we have a new Trans-Siberian Railroad, development of mining and fossil fuel and other operations in Siberia, the so-called Brezhnev feud food program, which contributed to the poisoning of agricultural lands. And so pollution grew worse in this, under this facade of legalism. There was law, but no power to enforce, and fines were so low that managers of polluting enterprises found it cheaper to pollute and pay fines and get bonuses 
rather than to heed environmental laws. Still, we see further expansion of civil society. And this really comes to full flowering in the Brezhnev era of perestroika and glasnost with extensive civic activism encouraged by Mikhail Gorbachev uh, with journalistic exposés on the cost of Soviet model of development, radiophobia after Chernobyl, people traveling to the West and seeing with their own eyes that, in fact, the story they've heard about the quality of life in the Soviet Union uh, being better than that in the West is actually misleading, that the worker uh, toils in a cleaner and safer environment in the, in the West. We also have the rise of the environmental impact statement and the creation, as in China, of an environmental protection agency. So, um, in the Brezhnev period, ministerial and party officials came to see the need for legal statutes and approaches for conservation and to find polluters. They sought more efficient use of resources, and they were also responding to international trends. In other words, there had been some rejuvenation of public concerns and participation in the Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and especially in Gorbachev era. But under President Putin, it seems that state interests have prevailed again in full force. One of the first things President Putin did in 2000 or 2001 was to emasculate the Environmental Protection Agency while turning Russia's Ministry of Natural Resources, as President Bush would do with the Department of the Interior in the United States, trying to turn it into an organization for the sale and exploitation of resources without regard to local, national, or international concerns. He sharply limited the input of NGOs in environmental policies and practices. He's chipped away significantly at several democratic reforms and fragile rights of nascent civil society. We see this in control of media, in the loving re-embrace of large-scale projects from nuclear power to space to hydroelectricity, with the added pressure of a slightly growing middle class, so the rise of a consumer society, continued energy inefficiency and resource inefficiency, and an unwillingness to deal with the Soviet legacy. There's a headlong effort to develop Arctic resources of oil and gas and mineral wealth in part in combo with Western firms, but Total and Stadt Oil, Total from France and Stadt Oil from Norway, have declined to work with Russia any further in developing some of the gas fields because they're worried about the environmental impact. I'm particularly worried about the privatization of uh, lands, but simultaneously their subjugation to government stockholding organizations. In other words, we now have an oligarch, oligarchic private ownership of resources, which is not good for the environment. In summary, I would say that bureaucrats and policymakers, landowners, owners of land in the name of the people, and now oligarchs have dominated Russian policymakers making for over 100 years. They tend to see resources in their development as their prerogative, and reject the participation of citizens in agenda setting or policy making about the environment. Whether czarist, Soviet, or the new authoritarianism of President Putin, the state has jealously regarded, guarded its power over the extensive natural and mineral resources of the Russian landmass. It's pursued resource development through large scale, inefficient, and environmentally risky projects from the taiga to the tundra to the, the deserts of Central Asia. Its engineering organizations and now state corporations have moved up and down riverways to manage re water resources for electricity, irrigation, and industry, but with inadequate attention to negative environmental impacts, let alone the needs of the masses. They've yanked copper, platinum, and nickel from the earth in dangerous and filthy mines, They've engaged in profligate use of timber. They've polluted with impunity. They've engaged in reclamation projects, which led directly and indirectly to the major fires in Russia in 2010. They've co-opted, ignored, 
subjugated or closed public organizations and voices whose input to environmental policy might have provided for measured and environmentally sound economic development pra practices, instead relying on planners' preferences, not citizens' interest, or presuming to speak for the citizen, state-run bureaucracies and businesses pursued over the last 100 years what I would call a misguided but certainly a costly development strategy that will have impact on public health and the environment for decades and decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. You are very concise. Uh, so we had an afternoon with a huge uh, range of subjects like risks, disasters. We could learn a lot about Fofau, Inamata, Chernobyl, and so the role of the state and how it, it changes in, in all the nations that we are here. We have heard this tonight. And one thing that uh, is interesting to think about is that uh, we see some ages of hiding problems and some ages of denouncing problems, which is very interesting to see the, the role of the states and, the, and the, its close relation with the environment. I don't know if we have time enough for some proposition of our coordination. Let, let me then tell a few Soviet jokes. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I will stop. You I will stop. I will minutes. stop mid word at six promptly. <laughs> you have an interview. Okay. Uh, please, let me do it first. Uh, I have a question, which is to what extent is the emergence of this Brexit relationship with going to exacerbate the control by the oligarchs? Uh, are there going to be some sort of international norm or anything? I don't know if I see a direct connection between uh, BRICS and uh, evolving Russian environmental uh, and resource management policies. I think it's important to look at the next few months and years at uh, the success of uh, Russia in establishing uh, new economic uh, relations and long-term ones, for example, the recent uh, agreement with China about oil and gas production, which I assume around 2017 or 2018 uh, might begin to uh, see results. Um, President Putin has also indicated uh, a desire to export uh, Russian technologies uh, that are connected with uh, nature, for example, uh, hydroelectric power stations um, to Nepal, to India. Um, the Ross Atom Corporation is uh, heavily seeking to uh, pursue, uh, to sell its nuclear technologies uh, abroad. Uh, nuclear reactors are, without accidents, envir have environmental impacts. There's taking of land. Uh, there's millions of gallons of water that's heated and then released into the environment and so on. So we have to consider nuclear reactors as well. So there will be some concrete impacts, but I think we'll need a few more years to see what they will be. Okay. I can hear there's just a fan blowing. That's the only Quite advanced in the 
You raise a number of interesting points. Uh, yes, uh, Russian Soviet scholars were um, uh, leaders in development of uh, ecological and environmental thinking. Uh, and as Doug Wiener has shown uh, uh, quite well, uh, advanced and pushed the establishment of a number of protected areas and would have liked to see them even larger. Um, but I think that their efforts uh, did not go as far as they had hoped for a variety of reasons. One was simply the anarchy uh, that uh, occurred in many places uh, after the revolution that limited state power as the state was trying to uh, impose its will, poaching by peasants or uh, farmers. Uh, and once the Stalinists uh, came to power, uh, rather than see the ownership of the land in the name of the people as an opportunity to set aside more land, they saw it as an opportunity to uh, harness natural resources to uh, build the state economy, which they rightfully noted uh, would uh, prepare them for the, uh, quote, inevitable war with the hostile capitalist nations that surrounded them. But there's certainly, when I first started studying uh, Soviet environmental practices, uh, that was my assumption that the socialist nation, uh, without uh, small-scale land ownership or capitalist fighting and just, I'm going to exploit this land before you do to make profit, that uh, somehow the socialists uh, ownership of the land in the Soviet Union would be a better thing. <laughs> a better thing. <laughs> There's one, one last question. Yeah, I think that the, uh, the anarchists like Kropotkin did not really contribute much to environmental thinking, but as uh, Yulia pointed out in her presentation this morning, looking at some of the things written in the, about the 19th century, uh, environmental thought, thought about uh, the threat to Russian nature. Uh, many people, artists, literary types, uh, soil scientists and others already felt keenly. Um, whether they exaggerated it or underplayed it is unclear, but they felt it keenly already in the 19th century. I think this is the last question. Yes. I know that everyone is, is uh, ready to go. Yes. Um. Uh, good, good afternoon. I have three remarks. Uh, one is about the use of uh, chemical weapons during the Second World War. Mm. I am a historian like you, and I ignore the facts about the use during the, the Second World War by the Soviets or by anyone. The second one is about academician Vernadsky and his concept of no sphere. What, what would you comment about this? And the third one, the BRICS countries established limits on the emission of CO in 2009, and Russia is among them. What do you think about this? Okay. Thank you. In, in terms of the last one, it's clear that uh, Russia is no longer going to uh, pay much attention to uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions. In terms of 
uh, chemical weapons. Uh, there's a recent study uh, produced, let's see, what is the name of the lead author, that shows that well into the 1980s, this, the Soviets developed against international treaty, and I understand, uh, developed uh, and produced, whether they used them or not is another question, but produced them, and there are uh, scars from the production of them during World War uh, II. And the, about uh, Vernadsky, many people consider him to be, uh, with his idea of the noosphere, one of the uh, most original thinkers of the 20th century in terms of uh, environmental uh, uh, thought and human nature interactions. Indeed. Paul is going to interview this guy.